So the framework that we're looking at, which is a familiar framework to a lot of you, is that when we're talking about Buddhist content, we divide it into categories of the basis, which is like Buddhist science or the way things exist. And the basis is the two truths. And that's just the way things are. That's not what you're doing with them. Yeah, it's just the information of how we think of reality. This is Buddhist philosophy. Then the path, the wings, this is the actual religion and practice of Buddhism. Here's what we do with that information. And then the result is the kayas or the Buddha bodies. So the basis, conventional truth and relative truth are things to understand and are described in the text. So relative truth is the way phenomena, all phenomena are misapprehended by ordinary beings due to ignorance. Ultimate truth is all phenomena being empty of inherent existence. So it's the way phenomena are perceived. It's not like there are two separate truths, it's there's two ways of seeing truth. Conventional truth is deceptive. What makes it deceptive? Our mind conditioned by ignorance. So the deception is not out there, right? The deception is coming from us. Ultimate truth is the fact of phenomena being empty. So the path then is method and wisdom. So method practices related to relative truth, such as loving kindness, compassion, patience, all the friendly, warm-hearted, good things. Then wisdom is related to ultimate truth practices to realize the emptiness of inherent existence of self and phenomena. And then the result of that, the result of practicing method related to relative truth are the rupakayas, the form bodies, and practices related to wisdom, related to ultimate truth, result in the dharmakayas, the wisdom bodies. Okay, so this basis, we just need to understand that the concepts of the two levels of reality, the two truths is employed in all schools of Buddhism to explain their understanding of the nature of reality. What constitutes a conventional truth and constitutes an ultimate truth might differ a little bit amongst the different philosophical tenets. So according to our school, the middle way school, the, per the perspective adopted in most of these mind training texts, ultimate truth refers to emptiness the absence of the intrinsic existence of all phenomena. So in contrast, cult conventional truth refers to the empirical aspect of reality as experienced through perception, thoughts, and language. Okay, so what you have in the verses is, like in verse 105, oh mind, saying to yourself, oh mind, understand that the topics discussed here are interdependent phenomena all for things must rely on dependent arising to have an existence. They cannot stand alone. The process of change is alluring like magic for physical form is but mental appearance as a torch whirling round seems a circle of flame. Okay, so physical form is but a mental appearance shows that the author Dharma Rakshita is not a middle way consequence school practitioner. So some schools say he's Vibashika, great exposition school, or maybe mind only school. But the poetry of it and the point of it is going in the right direction. So I think that we can all picture this where like, you know, you have fire twirlers at a festival or something and they're swirling it around and it's one point of light, but because they swirl it, it looks like a circle. This is the way our life is, is that we see the circle when in fact it's just the point of light, or we see what is deceptive, even though it's not what is real. So when we're looking at these verses, what we're trying to use the poetry for is to kind of break the spell of our habit that use, is used to believing in our ignorant projections. Things appear to us as truly existent. They look that way, they seem that way, they feel that way. The opposite is true. The opposite is true. Things are empty of inherent existence. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways of looking at this. You see this kind of poetry in all the mind training texts, try and get us to understand the point. And it's like the way of seeming is what we're challenging, the way things seem. 
So for example, if there's someone that you have not liked for many years, they, you don't like their personality, you don't like the way they talk to people, you think that they're rude and inconsiderate and abrasive, and you've got a whole story about what their behaviors mean to you and say about them as a person, okay? Someone you don't like. Then later down the track, you hear the story of their life from a third party. You hear about the suffering of their childhood. You hear about their physical distress. You hear about their pain. Maybe they came from this kind of background or that kind of background. And for whatever reason, that content makes sense to you in terms of the behaviors you've observed and you soften. And then you see them again and they don't look as ugly. They haven't had a facelift, nothing has changed, but the look of them is not so ugly to you. Them being in proximity to you is not so uncomfortable. The whole seeming of them has changed because of what you bring to, to seeing them. So it might seem like, oh, they seem so sweet now. And actually they're kind of attractive and look at their lovely clothing color choices. I don't know what you think anyway, but you know, like you see them and it looks different. They haven't changed. So this is the way it will be for us when we've realized emptiness, is that th things will seem different. They will seem in accordance with reality. Now, the example I gave is just playing with convention, right? That's not even moving towards ultimate truth, but it is starting to look at the surface surface of dependent arising. So the, the way that you actually understand reality, the emptiness of inherent existence, is via dependent arising. So you think about the way things depend upon parts and context. You can think about causes and conditions, that's helpful, that relates only to impermanent things, but parts and context already is kind of in alignment with how we've learned as adults to think of things in the big picture. So you think context in terms of this is only a big deal, this behavior or this event is only a big deal in reference to my life having these smaller events. Yeah. Or this person is a good person only because of the context and the conditioning I have about what criteria is met for a good person. But everyone has different criteria. So they're not good or bad from their own side. I've projected that on them. To someone else, they are the most dear. To someone else, they're completely indifferent. Nothing about them is screaming, annoying person. Everyone comes to this person with their own filter. Knowing that helps, yeah. So that's already in alignment with how we kind of know the world to be, yes? So parts and context point you to emptiness. You think if they do not exist from their own side, that means they exist in dependence upon parts and context. So they can't be inherently existent. They can't stand alone, independently, out of nowhere, causelessly, any of those things. They have characteristics, but they don't exist by way or from those characteristics. Yeah? So that kind of releases you into the spaciousness of emptiness and it being about infinite possibility, not about a void even though we'll even say voidness or suchness referring to emptiness, what we're talking about is potentiality. Yeah, which hasn't necessarily formed into anything in particular, but could be depending on the projections you bring and many other things. So when you're walking around in your life and you're trying to be a, a little aspiring bodhisattva, you meet resistance to different people. And then you release that resistance through the conventional processes of Tonglen or the ultimate processes of realizing emptiness, whichever works or consciously pivot back and forth because you'll need both of them eventually. So some days your resistance you meet with Tonglen, it shifts the tightness, it opens the heart. Some days you meet the resistance with they seem that way, that's not how they are. They appear truly existent. They're empty of inherent existence. And that releases the tension and opens the heart. And then the two, method and wisdom, become mutually reinforcing over time. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, um, it's a powerful 
way to look at things from the perspective of ultimate truth, but you also need relative truth at our level. So method, I think you get, yeah, method refers to the altruistic deeds of the bodhisattva, including the cultivation of compassion and the awakening mind. Wisdom or the Sanskrit term prajna and its Tibetan equivalent sherab have different applications depending on context. So in the Mahayana, prajna refers to the wisdom aspect of the path constitu constituted primarily by deep insight into the emptiness of all phenomena. So <clears throat> here, the practice of relative or conventional bodhicitta and the practice of ultimate bodhicitta. So relative bodhicitta is the bodhicitta we normally talk about. Relative bodhicitta is that main Mahayana motivation with two aspirations, to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So these aspirations become a main mind or a primary consciousness through study, deep conviction, repetition, and meditations. So this is a significant thing that something that starts as a thought, starts conceptual, analytical, words in your head, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. It starts that way, and then it fades, and then you have to remember it, and then you do a practice, and it reinforces it, and you have to come back to it again and again. But having done that, it eventually becomes together with your main minds, or it becomes a primary consciousness, which means then, ever after, when you have uncontrived bodhicitta, all your other thoughts are conditioned by bodhicitta. Yeah, just naturally and spontaneously. So this altruistic intention to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings, this awakening mind is characterized by an objective, the full awakening of Buddhahood, and a purpose, the fulfillment of others' welfare. And then ultimate bodhicitta is just that same main manhyana motivation with two aspirations in the mind of someone who has realized emptiness directly or perceptually. So if you've realized emptiness directly and you have bodhicitta, then you have ultimate bodhicitta. Yeah. And so the result of that is the actualization of our Buddha nature or our Buddha potential. So the form bodies are broken down into the enjoyment body, which is observable by people who have realized emptiness, Arya beings, and the emanation body is observable by ordinary beings like us. The Dharmakaya is divided into the wisdom truth body, which is developed through realizing emptiness. And this is called the developmental purity or the adventitious purity. This is the Buddha nature that must be developed then the nature truth body is the mind being empty of inherent existence. And this is the naturally abiding purity that's there by itself without any extra effort. It just comes into fruition when the others have been developed. So sometimes it sounds like we're already a Buddha, but we have to wake up to it. That's people talking about the naturally abiding Buddha nature or the naturally abiding purity. We also need the developmental purity, which is developed through realizing emptiness. The actualization of our Buddha nature in terms of like an emanation body, we get people like his holiness who we think are a Buddha. We think he is Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion. So Lama Zopa says, Chenrezig is always guiding us. He is the special deity karmically connected to the people of the Snowland Tibet and manifests in the form of his holiness, the Dalai Lama. So Guru Shakyamuni Buddha made predictions about the Dalai Lama's being Chenrezig and how they would particularly guide the sentient beings in Tibet, bringing them refuge and spreading the Dharma. Now, because His Holiness is vital to the people of the entire planet, Chenrezig is also the special deity for the whole world. So this is what we're working towards. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a snapshot basis path results. When we're looking at the text, we're looking for the most part at relative bodhicitta, and then we shift to looking at ultimate bodhicitta. So we'll talk more about ultimate bodhicitta after lunch, and um, I'll see you in an hour.